Hello and welcome to story time at nine. Uh, you just saw images. Uh, many of you are regular, of course, and you would be familiar that in the intro video, you just saw images of the Bakul Library here in Satyanagar in Bhubaneswar and images from storytelling from around the world that we used to do at the library 10 years back. But then that time, what we used to do is we used to have volunteers visiting Orissa, visiting Bhubaneswar, who would come and tell stories from the country. But then uh, now, you know, we are lucky, all of you are lucky that we have been able to mobilize the best storytellers from each country, you know, who are telling stories from that country and also giving us an insight into the culture of the country. And a lot of people have been asking me, how are you able to reach out to these, uh, the best of the professional storytellers? Now, let me tell you that a lot of them we have been able to reach out thanks to people like Giovanna that we have today. Uh, Giovanna Conforto, today's storyteller, uh, is one of the most famous storytellers in the world. She, you know, the best place to learn storytelling. Many of you have been asking uh, and you have already sent questions about how to become a storyteller yourself. Now, the best place to learn storytelling in the world is the School of Storytelling in UK. And Giovanna is uh, teaches storytelling there, and she is very well connected. So when I reached out to Giovanna, thanks to another storyteller friend, and she agreed, she said, this is a wonderful idea. And then I said, can you connect us with other storytellers? So that is how, you know, so that's the answer to your question about how we are able to reach out to all these fascinating storytellers. But anyway, so here is Giovanna from the country, the the original country of the quarantine. Uh, as some of you know, you know, quarantine actually started way back in the 14th century uh, with the big plague that happened in Italy. And Giovanna is here to tell us stories from Italy and to introduce Italy to us. Over to you, Giovanna. Well, hello to everyone. I'm Giovanna Conforto. I'm here in the storytelling center. We have a storytelling center here in central Italy where I live. And I'm going to share a few stories from my heritage. The first story is called The Florentine. And uh, I'm telling you this story because I am from Florence. Well, this is St. Francis. It's the next story. But the first story is The Florentine. And it goes like this. Once upon a time, there was a man. He was a wonderful man, he liked people, he enjoyed life, and he spent a lot of time in the taverns, drinking and having fun with his friends. But he always said he did not have stories to tell. I'm sorry, I know how to do many things, I like to enjoy stories, I like to listen to stories, but I don't have stories to tell. So one day he decided he would go on a journey. So he sell, sold what he had and he started walking and walking and walking and walking and walking and walking. And he went out of the city of Florence through the big door, which is called the Porta San Frediano. He walked and he walked and he walked and he walked and then he came to a church and it was dark. It was late, he was hungry, and so he knocked at the door of the church. Talk, talk, talk. The door opened, the priest came out and said, Who are you? Well, I'm a Florentine. I am want to travel because I would like to find some stories to tell. Oh, that's really wonderful, said the priest. You know what? I would like to travel with you. Of course, said the Florentine. That's a fantastic idea. You know, two people together travel better than one. And so the two started walking and walking and walking and walking and walking and walking. And they got to a farm in the evening. They knocked, talk, talk talk. It was dark. They were hungry. They were tired. The door opened and out came the farmer and said, hello, what are you doing? Here we are a Florentine and a priest and we are traveling. We are traveling because we want to find some stories to tell. And so the farmer let them in, sat them down, gave them food. They went to bed and the next morning the farmer said, 
you know what? I love your idea. I also would like to come and join you. And so we, all three of us will have stories to tell. Fantastic, said the other two. And the next morning, they started, guess what? Walking. And they walked, 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 until it was dark, they were hungry, it was cold, and there was a very big black door right in front of them. They were scared. They didn't like that door, but they looked all around, and there was nowhere else to go. And so they decided to knock, and the knock went like this. <laughs> the big portal opened. And out came a giant, an enormous, terrible giant, and said, yes, what are you looking for? The Florentine said, I think we got the wrong address. I think we'll go somewhere else. And thank you for your hospitality. No. No, do come in, said the giant. And so he sat them down, gave them food. They went to bed. And next morning, the three of them were surprised to still be alive. The next morning, the, pre the giant said, oh, you know, I have a church here. I'm really, really looking for a priest for it. Come, come, I will show you the way. And he brought the priest to the church and the Florentine followed. And when the priest was in the church, he saw that the giant opened a big trap and flew, flew the priest inside. Ooh, that's scary thought the Florentine, and so he started running and running and running to the other side of the courtyard to warn the farmer. But you teach me that giants have very long legs, and so he went very much quicker than the Florentine. And so the giant had already arrived to the other side to see the farmer. And he was showing the farmer around. This is my farm. I really could do with a farmer like you. And then he opened the trap and flew. He flung the farmer inside the trap. Wow, thought the Florentine. I am going to be the next. I am going to be the next. What can I do? What can I do? The first thing that came to his mind was, I need to take time. And so he saw that the giant's eye was wounded. He had something in his eye. And he thought, mm, I'm going to try and trick him. And so he started saying, you know that eye of yours, which looks very sore, I think I have a medicine for it, right, exactly the right medicine. You, you, you know what we will do? I, I need a cauldron, a big pot of boiling oil, and I will put some special herbs that I am an expert of. Of course, the Florentine knew nothing about herbs, but he just grabbed the first pieces of grass that he saw in his garden. He put them inside, and then he said to the giant, you know, it would be better if I could tie your hands behind your back, because this could be a little bit painful. So then he went there and he tied the giant's hands, because the giant was very big, but he wasn't very wise. And so he took the cauldron full of boiling oil, the Florentine, and splash! He splashed it in the giant's face. And the giant started screaming. And the giant was still screaming when the Florentine saw a ring falling right beside his face. Foot. Now the Florentine, he knew he was not to touch that ring, 
but he was so curious and the ring was so beautiful with a very big green stone and it would look so good on his finger and so he took the ring and he put it on his finger and the moment he did it he understood that was not a good idea because the finger started to get cold and then hard and then gray and the Florentine understood that his finger was starting to turn into stone so he took his knife and snatched it off and he started running and running and running and first he freed the priest then he freed the farmer and then he went out of the big portal of the house of the giant and he ran and he ran and he ran and he ran in front of the farm and he ran in front of the church and he ran through the big door of the city of Florence called the Porta San Frediano and he ran and he ran and he ran until he sat down in the tavern in front of all his friends and said, well, my friends, now at least I have a story to tell. And this is the first of our stories for today and it tells us a bit about the spirit of Italians who are curious and who like to explore new things and also love to tell stories. And our next story, and now we can have the slide of St. Francis, please, is the story of this man. Well, St. Francis, you need to know, is the patron saint of Italy. We are a Catholic country. We will see it afterwards in the presentation. We are, we have the home of the Catholic Church in our capital city in Rome, the Vatican, and we have a, a, a saint for every town and every region. And then we have a saint that covers, as you can see here on the map, the whole of the country of Italy. And for us, it is St. Francis. And St. Francis is a symbol for peace and reconciliation all over the world because he was a very, very nice person. Okay, the slide can go off and we'll go back to the story. One day, St. Francis was preaching in the city of Gubbio, which is in central Italy. And he was told that a fierce, a fierce, a terrible, a terrible, terrible wolf was frightening the population. It wasn't only frightening the population, it started to eat animals here and there, a sheep, a goat, a chicken. And then, lately, it had also started to eat human beings. Of course, all the people were terrified. There was a terrible wolf and they came together and they started saying, we must do something, we must fight against the wolf. And so they would go in groups and try to kill the wolf. But the wolf was never to be found. He was always hidden somewhere. But at night, it would come out and it would harm the people and the animals again. It was right in that moment that St. Francis reached Gubbio. And everybody was talking about this in the central square. You know, there is a wolf and he's eating and this and that. He has attacked my child. He has attacked my animals. He has attacked my house. We must go, we must go and kill it. But St. Francis said, no, please, please wait, my friends, I will go. I will go and talk to the wolf. I will meet the wolf and I will try and find a solution. And so St. Francis went, first with a group of friends, and then because all the others were so scared, they stayed behind. And St. Francis went by himself, walking and walking and walking and walking into the forest. And at a certain point, he saw the wolf. It was really very, very big, and it was very, very angry, and it was howling Rah! at St. Francis. But St. Francis was not scared 
And so he stood still and he put his hand in front of him and he started walking towards the wolf and the wolf calmed down, stopped howling and put his head down. And when St. Francis was very near, he asked the wolf, what has happened to you? Tell me your story. I would like to know. The wolf was really very surprised. Nobody has ever asked him that. Everybody just came and tried to kill him, to, to hurt him. But this person, this man, was asking him what his story was. And so the wolf answered. He said, you know, I didn't want to hurt anyone. I was left behind. I, I was part of a big pack. But then I got left behind. I was just a, a little one. And I was just a pup. And I was wounded. I, I was scared. And then all these people came. And then at night, I was hungry. I just wanted to nourish myself. I am sorry. I really didn't want to hurt anyone. I understand, said St. Francis. I really do hear your story. Now, you should promise, promise not to harm anyone else. And I am sure all will be well. And he put his hand forward in, again. And the wolf put his paw on St. Francis' hand. And they went together, walking side by side to the village. Of course, when the people saw him come with the, with, the, with the fierce wolf, they were terrified and said, what are you doing? This wolf is going to kill us, it's going to hurt us. Do not worry, said St. Francis. This wolf is now your friend. And so it was, and so it was that the wolf lived until a very old age and took care and protected the village until the last of his days. And this is the story of St. Francis of the Wolf. There are many, many, many versions of this story. There are stories, uh, there are versions in which uh, St. Francis talks, there are versions in which the wolf talks, there's different versions, and this is just the version I prefer. And now we can go to the next image. I am sure everybody knows this picture. It is the Mona Lisa. I think it is the most famous uh, painting in the whole world. Well, it is not in Italy. It is in the Louvre in Paris, and it has been painted by Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci was a genius. He knew how to do a lot of things. He was a painter, he was an engineer, he built many things, he, he built sceneries for, um, uh, for theater, and he also, but what people don't know is that he also wrote some fables. And the fables are quite unknown, and. Uh, he was born not far from my hometown, not far from Florence. And now I'm going to share a little story from Leonardo da Vinci. Okay, the image can go. Once upon a time, there was a tree. And I know you have a project on plants, but there was this tree. And the tree was always grumbling and mumbling and complaining. It was an old tree. And as sometimes many old people do, he could not see the beauty of life anymore. Just next to him, he had a pole and a hedge. 
And he was always complaining with a pole and a hedge. Oh, you hedge, why are you there? You are taking the air away from me and I cannot breathe. And you, pole, are taking the view out of my sight. Why don't you just go away and go away? And every day and every day, the old grumbling tree would go on and on and on and on. But one day, a little lizard came. Her name was Lily. It was the first time that she was out of her hole and she was looking around and singing la 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 how beautiful, how nice, oh that's really nice, that's really good. And what does she see? She sees the old tree going. We say brontolare in Italian. Brontola qui, brontola lì. Always complaining and rumbling and mumbling. And the little lizard looks at the tree and says, Hey, you old silly tree. Can't you see that the pole which is next to you is keeping you straight and the hedge is protecting you from the wind? The tree looked at the little lizard and said, I have never seen it that way. I have always seen that these two are in my way. But wait, wait, wait. Now that I look around, I think that you are right. And so, since that day, that old mumbling and rumbling and brontolone tree stopped complaining and started being very, very, very kind to all his fellow creatures in the forest. And this is the story of Leonardo da Vinci, the pole and the tree. And now we're going to go further and we're going to go to another very, very, very important thing. We, as we will see in the presentation, there is a lot of beauty in Italy. We really have a lot of beauty. We have a lot of artistic beauty. We have a lot of uh, uh, our buildings. We have beautiful cities, but also nature. We have beautiful nature. And this is a waterfall. It is the, called the, the waterfall of Le Marmore. And uh, most people in Italy know the waterfall of the Marmore first because it's very beautiful. It looks a bit like Niagara Falls uh, in between the United States and Canada. It's really, really huge and big, but most uh, students go on a school trip to it. And I first saw it when I went to school trip when I was in fifth grade or fourth grade, I don't exactly remember. But there is a beautiful legend, as you can see, you maybe can see that there are two rivers that are that make the waterfall and i am going to share here the legend of uh, the creation of these two waterfalls once upon a time there was a hunter and this hunter was called velino he was a very, very, very good hunter and he would hunt in the forest and always bring back the best animals. So he was looking around very quiet and silently in the forest and he saw a deer, a deer that looked made out of gold. And so shining it was. So he took his arrow and his bow and he was going to shoot at the deer when he heard a voice. A voice coming from a deer? I never saw that, thought Bellino. And the deer started to shine. And the voice said, I am not a deer. I am the goddess Diana. I am the goddess of this, uh, of this forest and the goddess of nature. And if you do not kill me, I will grant you a wish. A wish? 
thought to think, you know, that is a very good idea. That is something that could solve a very big problem of mine. Because Avellino, you need to know, was in love. And he was in love with a nymph. And the nymph was called Nera. But Nera did not love Verino. And so he said to the goddess Diana, yes, I will not kill you. I will save your life. You will be fine. But I want the love of the nymph Nera. And so the beautiful goddess Diana said, so it shall be. And the goddess went to speak with the nymph Vera, Nera. And he, she said to her, now you must love Velino. But the nymph said, no, I am sorry. I do not love him. I do not love him. I do not want to be with him. I do not want to be friends with him. I don't even want to see him. And she turned her head to the other side, leaving the goddess behind. The goddess was so angry and so angry and so angry. She said, you are going to regret this. You are going to regret this to the point that you are going to melt in your own tears. And she transformed it. She transformed her, the nymph, into a river. Bellino had seen this had seen the scene and had seen the person, the woman, the nymph he loved transformed in a beautiful river. And so he knelt on the side of the river and started crying and crying and crying and said to the goddess, you have done me no good. Look, I will never be able to be with the person I love now. I would like to join her. You cannot join her, said the goddess. I cannot undo what I have done. You cannot undo what has God has done. I understand, said Velino. I understand. You know what? I would like to join her. So if she has been transformed into a river, I too want to become a river. So shall it be, said the goddess. And Velino too was transformed into a river. And the two met. And the Nera understood the bad she had done. And she wanted now to meet Velino. And they met in an enthusiasm of passion and love. And we can still see all that passion and love and enthusiasm of meeting of the two lovers in the energy of the waterfall of the Marmore. Here we go. And this is the beautiful waterfall of the Marmore with its energy. And we're coming. Yeah, yeah, we can go to the last to the last slide, we're going to our last story. I wish if you know this, uh, I think it's known all over the world. We're going to go through it, but I think you know how important food is for the Italian. We have a lot of things we love, but food is absolutely one of them. And this is a very famous and traditional um, Christmas cake called il panettone. And it also has a beautiful legend about it. And it's a funny one. I like it. And it goes like this. Okay, the panettone can go. The panettone has been created at the same time in which Leonardo, the same period when Leonardo was painting the Mona Lisa. It was at the beginning of the 16th century. Okay, the panettone can go. Thank you. So at the beginning of the 16th century in Milan, which is a city in the north of Italy, the king was Ludovico il Moro. And Ludovico il Moro, he was very glutton. 
He loved exquisite food and he wanted everything to be perfect. Also because he liked to make a beautiful banquets and invite the most important people in the world. Because at those times, Milan was a very important city. And so to do all that, he had a cook. And this cook was called Umbertone. He was a big fat man and he had a big voice and he was in charge of everything. And Ludovico il Moro, the king, would go to Umbertone and say, Umbertone, Umbertone, please, I want everything to be perfect because today is Christmas and it is Christmas Eve. You are going to prepare the first course, the second course, the third course, the fourth course, the fifth course, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth, the ninth, uh, and then at the end, I want a cake. And the cake must be the most exquisite that you have ever made. Oh, no problem, no problem, said Umbertone. I will do exactly what you say. <coughs> but Umbertone could not do everything by himself. He needed a helper and he did have a helper and his name was uh, Tony. And Tony, he had a problem because Tony was always falling asleep. And Umbertone said to Tony, Tony, you must be careful. Today is Christmas Eve and the king wants everything to be perfect. So please do not fall asleep. No problem, no problem, said Tony. I'm awake, I'm awake, I will be fine. Listen, said Umbertone, everything has been done. The only thing you have to do is take the cake at the end of the day and put it into the oven. 20 minutes and it will be done. Clear? Ah, no problem, no problem, said, Umber, said the Tony. No problem. And Umbertone left. Two minutes later, Tony was <laughs> and sleeping and snoring, and he was awakened by the smell. The smell, terrible smell, terrible smell. Everything had burnt. Half an hour had gone by, and the cake was burnt. And Tony was desperate. What am I going to do now? And so he took, he took everything he found. He took some flour. He took some eggs. He took some sugar. He took some everything he can put, raisins and uh, and uh, candies and everything he could put. He made a big thing, and he put it in the oven. Right in that moment came back the king with Umbertone. And the king, Ludovico il Moro, said, I would like to taste this evening's cake. And Umbertone said, no problem, it's just out of the oven. And so he pulled out something that he had never seen. There was a big moment of tension and everybody starting to shiver because, you know, the king was could be quite naughty. But then the king, he pinched a piece of the cake and he tasted it. And after a long silence, he said, mm, this is very good. <gasps> Umbertone was so pleased and then the king asked what is the name of this new cake of yours that nobody has ever seen before and Umbertone didn't know what to say and so he said it is il pan del Tony which means the bread of Tony pan del Tony Panettone. And this is the legend of the origin of the word panettone. And since that day, it was the beginning of the 16th century, till today, each and every Christmas, we eat panettone. And this was the end of my stories. And uh, I think we can go back to... Here we are. Thank you so much.
love the stories Thank and you. i think uh, we got five the maximum stories we've ever got and yeah. thank you so much it was lovely uh, of course children uh, the most famous italian story of course is that many of you might already be knowing is the story of pinocchio uh, the book that you see here uh, is actually the odia version you know of pinocchio which was the first book to be published by bakul you know uh, and it actually happened uh, through a workshop by some italian volunteers at the library the yes, children let me there's always yeah. really good connection between india and italy we're really we're really brother countries or sisters i don't know exactly and and the illustrations giovanna have all been done by children oh, and you've published their name yeah so in okay. fact uh, those of you who are watching uh, just to let you know that bakul has started publishing picture books but they're mostly in you know as we were setting up the libraries we realized that uh, we have lovely books in english but we don't really have books in our local language odia ah. which a lot of children would require yeah. so there are nursery rhymes and there are other books there are also a couple of bilingual books uh, like the mini fish tale here uh, and gulmohar so those of you you know who are interested in these books you can contact us and you can take them uh, you know buy them you can also come uh, you can contact us at this email id contact bakul uh, but anyway uh, going back to uh, story time at 9 many of you have been asking you know if we miss any session can we still watch it yes you can the sessions you know you are seeing it either on youtube or on facebook or twitter and the videos remain there in fact the best place to view the videos later is either on youtube or facebook on facebook you can go to videos and see them on youtube of course it is there so you can see them any time but and see uh, you know as i said you know all of us have put in so much effort to get the best storytellers to you i'm sure you love the experience uh, and people like giovanna have been helping us and and see it's all the spirit of giving with which you know they're doing because no one is charging anything for this the minimum the only request for all of you is if you love the videos please like them please subscribe to the channel and please share it on your social media and when you share it you know so that you know we will get encouraged if more and more children view this video i'm sure giovanna will also feel nice if her stories of the clee reach out to more children like you so please help in sharing the good word you know so that more and more children can join and when you share on social media on facebook instagram or twitter please tag us bakul foundation you know use hashtag bakul foundation so that we get to know and we can also share it uh now the questions are going to be enabled again there have been some complaints some of you have complained that you know we have disabled the comments box particularly on youtube uh, during the storytelling but believe me that's because a lot of people also requested us to do that because the, many of the children were getting distracted and not listening you know you have such a wonderful opportunity to listen to wonderful stories and i understand that we are not meeting each other we are not going to school so what happens is we also feel like chatting with our friends so that is why but the questions are uh, on now you can post your questions just a little you know i can understand that many of you would feel bad if your question was not answered but imagine we have sent out a question form in advance and over 200 people have asked questions it is not possible really in 10 15 or 20 minutes to answer all the questions right so please understand that but we will try and our best to ensure that your questions are asked but just to let you know which questions we choose we normally avoid questions uh, which is not uh, giving us an insight into the culture of the country you know questions that require a yes or no answer do you like india you know no questions like that or questions about facts and figures what is the population of italy you know we can always search for that on the internet but but questions that that give us an understanding about uh, for example uh, giovanna said that you know it's a catholic country and she will be talking about italy of course 
But then if you have a question like, do you go to church? Do people go to the church? Um, are people very religious in Italy? But that is a question that will help us understand Italy better. You know, so anything uh, you can ask her. Many of you have asked if, you know, what is her favorite food or which is the favorite dish of Italians? Now, that is uh, the kind of question that, you know, we would probably ask. Uh, uh, but please bear with us. Please understand that we cannot possibly ask all the questions. But we will be asking questions. So what happens is the video is scheduled by Wednesday on YouTube or Facebook. And in the description, we put the question form. In addition to that, of course, those of you who get the messages from your schools, we also send the question form there in which you can send questions in advance. But it's also there on YouTube and Facebook when the video. So by Thursday, you'll find it there. Uh, so that's it for now. Uh, let's hear from Giovanna about Italy and then we'll come back. Okay. Hello again. Okay. So first thing is our flag. Our flag and uh, it is green and white and red. And I found a, a saying that says it is green like our green fields because we have a lot, a lot of fields and a lot of trees. We have mountains and it is white like our mountains and the red is for the passion because we are a very passionate people. And so for us, love, amore, la, 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 it's amore. This comes from us and it means love. And so uh, we are traditionally and people say that we are very passionate and love is very important for us. So these, this is our flag and the meaning of our colors. There are many other meanings and also more historical meanings, but I'd like to just present the country a little bit like that. Thank you. We can go to the next slide. Now, this is Italy. As you can see, it is divided in 20 regions. And these 20 regions are very, very different from north to south. They say that there are 20 different languages that we speak, a bit like in India. So maybe not that different, but they're not really dialects. And the traditions are very different because the different parts of Italy, like India, have had different uh, uh, history. So the north was uh, usually connected to France, the north uh, um, west and the northeast, more like under the Austrians and the south with the Spaniards and the center with the history of the church. But then it changed, it changed, it changed, it changed over the years. We are a quite um, uh, young country, a bit older than you, but we are still a young country because we were reunited 150 years ago. And so Italian is a relatively, the language that we all speak is a relatively young language. And it is, it has been based on the Florentine. So the language of the city of Florence that I come from and the, the city of the store of the first story we heard, the story of the Florentine and also the town where uh, Leonardo da Vinci grew up. So for us Florentine people, Italian is very easy. As for many people, other people, they have they are lucky because they can be bilingual, as I think it's exactly the same in many places in India. And so this is something that we have similar. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So our capital city is Rome. I think you, have, you all have seen the Colosseum. This is the symbol of Rome. It, is, it has, was the capital of a big empire, the Roman Empire, and it has been the capital of Italy, not since the beginning of history. First it was Turin, the capital of Italy, then it has been Florence, and uh, Rome has only been the third capital of our country, but now it's been our capital for a long time, and this is the symbol of the uh, ancient uh, Roman tradition and of its remains. Okay, next slide please. 
and it is also, as I was saying before, the center of Christianity. So this is the Vatican, and the Vatican, I think, is the smallest country in the whole world, because inside the city of Rome, which is quite a big capital, not as Delhi or Mumbai, much smaller, it only has six million inhabitants, there is a teeny, teeny, tiny little town, which is called the, the city of the Vatican in which there is uh, the king, let's say, the, the pope is the chief of this tiny little state that lives inside our state. And, uh, and he is the chief of Christianity and he rules of all the Catholics in the whole world. He's the spiritual leader. Okay, next please. This is also, now we're going north, we're going towards Tuscany. I am here in Tuscany, well, in the north part of Tuscany, in Emilia-Romagna. And uh, this is, I think you all know it, I put it because I think everybody who's ever known anything about Italy knows the Leaning Tower of Pisa, which is quite a miracle. I mean, it's really, really strange for an old piece of architecture like this to be still standing, although it's so leaning on one side, as you can see. And it is another one of the most famous uh, symbols of Italy. It is in Pisa, which is not far from Florence, which is the next slide that we will see now. This is Florence, my hometown. This is the Duomo of Florence. Florence is known for its Renaissance, uh, uh, Brunelleschi uh, and Machiavelli and, uh, and a lot of uh, literature and uh, Leonardo da Vinci. And uh, uh, if you study art, uh, you cannot bump into Florence. It is um, where my mother came from and uh, it is a town which is very dear to me and um, this is also one of the symbols of Italy and very famous and I really do invite you if you can to come and visit it as all the rest of Italy. Okay next slide please. Ah, this is something I am not very good at, but uh, what is famous in Italy? So we were chatting with Sujit, what is uh, so famous about Italy? Well, one thing is cars, because we have a lot of beauty. As we have seen, we have beauty of, uh, of landscapes, very beautiful landscapes in Italy. We have beauty of art and of architecture, but we also have beautiful cars and other beautiful things that we will soon see. And so there is Maserati, Lancia, Lamborghini, Alfa Romeo, uh, Pan, Pagani, uh, Abarth, Ferrari, I'm sure you know Ferrari, very powerful red cars and also in the in the races of the cars, Ferrari is not doing very well now, but it is really a very important team and Fiat more modest. I, we have a husband, my husband and I have a little Fiat and it is what, and I've heard that also many Fiats also they were in, uh, in India, not so many lately I think, but there used to be a lot of Fiat Cinquecento and uh, Fiat cars also in India. Next slide, please. Another very, very important thing in Italy is fashion. I'm not so much into fashion either, but uh, I, because I don't know much about fashion, I, try, I, I put uh, something that remembers our flag, the green, and I think that the first one is Gucci, and uh, there is Gucci, um, Valentino, uh, all the big, many, most of the big uh, fashion industry comes from Italy and we have a, a lot of uh, uh, meetings and a lot of uh, shows, fashion shows in Italy. It's really something very important. And, uh, and Italian women are very famous for being elegant, but I must say, because I have been in India, I have never seen a people as elegant as Indians. I really, the saris are something that really leave me astonished and the, and the art of dressing and the elegance of Indians. But still, Italy is also famous for fashion. Next slide, please. 
And football. Other thing I know nothing about, but my husband, he's really passionate about football. And so the big teams, of course, the national theme, uh, team, and then uh, Milan, Juventus. I am sure you know much more than me about all this, but it is really, really an important thing. So every Sunday afternoon, everybody's there with their radio because they don't go on television and they look at the radio or at the internet or on uh, on television it's just just the sliding information and then you can be in the evening in, in a big city or in a small city where i live and then at a certain point at eight o'clock you will hear Rah! people shouting from their windows and it's because the somebody so what happened is it the fire no it's their football team that has done a won a match and that is really really something important and then the people are against each other and on a monday morning everybody's chatting in the bar about this team or the other team it's really the national thing to do to talk about football soccer i don't know how you call it okay next slide and here we come to my passion, and it is food. I mean, here you have pasta, which is in the colors. Uh, the, the, we have the, the simplest pasta we can have is really, of course, a spaghetti alla bolognese. Bolognese is very famous with meat, but my favorite, and the one I really think is the most delicious, is the most simple, is just uh, uh, pasta, with tomato, basil, a little of olive oil, and for me, it is the best food in the whole world. And it is as simple as this. Next slide, please. But, but you say, okay, everybody in Italy eats pasta, yes. Everybody in Italy eats pasta, I would say at least once a day. A bit like new rice, I presume. We eat pasta a lot. Um, but pasta, as you can see in the slide, is completely different. So as we speak different languages from north to south, even, and I think it's exactly the same in India, the tradition, it's easy to say everybody eats pasta. No. In the south, each village, each town, each region has their different shapes of pasta. So some are long, some are short, some are fat, some are thin, different types and shapes and kinds of pasta with different seasoning. So you will not eat the same pasta in the north, in the center, in the south. So the city we have seen, not the same in Roma. In Roma, you will have Bucatina la Matriciana. And in Florence, it's more like soups. And in, and, and in north, in Milan, we also have a lot of uh, rice. They eat a lot of rice there. And so each region has their uh, tradition about food. And the last slide is what puts everybody together. Because the traditionally, um, the pizza, this is uh, uh, pizza margherita. As you can see, it also has the same colors as our flag. It is white and red and green. And it is, again, the same ingredients. It is just flour, a, a bit of mozzarella cheese, tomato and basil. And it is uh, traditionally from Naples, but you can find exquisite pizza all over Italy and everybody in Italy loves pizza and I think everybody in the world knows and loves pizza. And this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Giovanna. I love the fact that you focused a lot on food. Uh, yeah. vegan, as you know, like the Italians, as you said, we also love our food yeah. and we love to talk about food. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, talking about pizza, I remember I had this friend, uh, we had this friend, uh, Sarah Manzo, and she was volunteering here. And she would say, you know, mostly, you know, the pizza that we get to eat is uh, American, like Pizza Hut, Domino's. And then she would say, that is not pizza. That is not the way we make our pizza. 
So, well, I, I had to learn not to be fussy. I live part of the year in England. I don't mind being. I think if there's flour, there's tomato, there's cheese, anything is pizza, and it's nice to eat. Okay. So, in fact, there were questions um, uh, about the most special. Ayushman from DAV had asked, "What is the most special food of uh, Italy?" So, would you say it's a pizza? I think pasta and pizza are both uh, very famous and very loved yeah. and after that and after that after that well there's a lot of uh, it's very regional so uh, near the sea the fish is very good so there's a lot of uh, tradition of eating fish or eating meat the soups there's exquisite soups and then there's uh, also uh, um, desserts I'm sure you know panna cotta, tiramisu. These are oh, also yeah. in our tradition. So, yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, uh, Srihan, Devansh, Ayushman, uh, Ahana, you got your answers. Uh, Ahana had a specific question about your favorite dish. My, I think my favorite dish is just, uh, as I said in the presentation, just plain pasta with tomato and basil. That's my, oh, okay. that is something I could eat every day. Ah, so uh, Anvesha from ODM Public School is asking, where is your hometown? But that's something you've already answered, right? Yeah, my hometown is from, I was born in England. I was born in England. Uh, uh, my parents were both Italian, but my but my my home, I, I live here in the outskirts of Florence, in the, in the mountains, but my, my hometown is Florence. Yeah. So, Akruti of ODM School and Bhumika of DAB want to know the names of your mother and father, since you mentioned that they're Italians. Oh, that's a nice story. My, my, my name is Giovanna, and my father's name was Giovanni. But the two things are not related, because my mother had chosen my uh, name much long before she met my father. Oh. But what if you had been a boy? Well, not a possibility. <laughs> if she had decided she would have had two girls, two daughters, and the eldest would be called Alessandra and the other one Giovanna. She had decided this when she was 13 years old, and so it has been. And, oh. and my mother's name was Bianca, which means white. Okay. So, good. So, Shruti from DAV and Shreyans are curious to know which is the most famous place in Italy. I think you've talked about many places, but which would you say is the most popular and the favorite spot that Italians would like to go to? Well, the most romantic, I didn't put it because we can't do anything. The most romantic city in, in, Ven in Italy is Venice, where everybody wants to go. It is a city which is floating on, on the sea, and it has these uh, the typical sh uh, ships that are called gondola, and you go and, you, uh, and everybody wants to go there on their honeymoon. In I think fact... Uh, the uh, you might have heard or seen this Indian superstar Amitabh Bachchan mm -hmm. yeah. in one of his earlier films. You know, there's a song on a gondola, which yeah. I think also came from a very famous uh, music uh, musical score. It goes like this. That's in Hindi. But anyway, that I thought you'll recognize the tune. Let's see what other questions we have. Lots of questions. So Arya Pasita is asking, uh, but it's but natural that there must be an uh, influence of Italian culture on your stories and storytelling. Would you like to speak a little about that? Well, not really. I mean, I, I had to search for, because I, I started telling stories in English, really. And when I went to England and when I started studying and then performing, and it's been, it's been a long search for my heritage. And so uh, there is, I, I think there is uh, something Italian in my way of being, in my way of telling, in my way of choosing. And I, I feel I am Italian, so I, I feel that everything I do is, 
is uh, based on my Italian heritage, but I, I love telling stories from other from our, other heritages, always with respect. But I, I really like to tell the stories that I feel connected to, rather from my heart rather than from my heritage. Hmm. Yeah. So um, there are a lot of questions about uh, the main festival, festivals in Italy. Ayushmati, Rani, Silvi, Satvik, they're all asking about festivals in Italy. Festivals, storytelling festivals. No, 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 festivals generally, like Christmas or other uh, festivals. Yeah, yeah, Christmas is very, very important. So we have, uh, we have the Catholic uh, festivals. So we have uh, uh, Easter is very important. It's, uh, it comes in spring. It's uh, the death and resurrection of uh, Christ. And uh, it's a very, it's a festival full of light. We usually have on the Friday, we have uh, the death of the, of, of, of Christ, but then on Sunday we have the resurrection, so everything is full of flowers and joy and love and hope. And then we have Christmas, which is when uh, when Jesus was born, and uh, it's a very nice festival that we live with our families, uh, if possible, around the fire, and we, uh, we and we share gifts, and uh, and then we have another couple, but these are the main ones. And then the new year, the new year comes a week after Christmas. So the period between take a long holiday, students have a long holiday between the 23rd of December and the 6th or the 7th of January, because we have a festival that nobody else has, and it's called La Befana. And it's on the 6th of January, and it's an old witch that comes, and she brings a call to the children who have not been good, who have been naughty, and brings sweets and gifts to the children who have been good. And she comes through the chimney. And it's oh. an Italian tradition. And last year we've had here in, um, in Portico, we had a workshop celebrating this, uh, this uh, character. That it's only in Italy. I see. So, children, if you plan to make your uh, tour to Italy and you want to be there around the 6th of January, yes. please ensure that you are being good children. Yeah. You know, you don't want... Uh, no, she sees that. Uh, she sees everything. Ah. <laughs> right. So, um, Satvik is asking about traditional dances of Italy. Oh, there's a lot. As I've shown the different, uh, we have um, the different uh, pastas, the same, different dances. Uh, and with the most famous that comes to my mind is the tarantella. No, we have a lot of traditional dances, and people still dance them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's groups. Mm. But uh, you know, like we get to hear a lot about uh, Italian food, music, cinema. Of course, yeah. Uh, we don't hear so much about the dances, particularly, you know, in. Yeah. But uh, yeah, maybe we don't export them so much. It's it's still uh, people dance them in in traditional you know meetings and uh, but the, 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 especially the ones from the south that are more that are nicer. There are still festivals in which people dance. Yes. Uh, Giovanna, can you do that again? So, children, what I want you to do is uh, please watch Giovanna carefully and try and imitate the tarantella. Uh, the way she's singing and moving her body. I'll also try to do that. And please take a video of yourself and send it to us on contact buckle, you know, our email ID, share it with us because, you know, Giovanna was saying that, you know, I, I'm unable to see the children who are watching me. But maybe when you do the Tarantella, the way she danced and you share it, she can know. Some of you had shared, uh, you know, uh, the wombat song of Kiran's last time. So once again, Giovanna. 
Okay, great. Um, there are quite a few questions like Shruti, Himanshu, uh, Ahana, Anvesha, um, um, Sai, all of them asking, how did you become a storyteller? How did you, what inspired you to become a storyteller? Absolutely by chance. I met a storyteller. I went to a workshop and I immediately knew that that was the, what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I really, it, it's been love at first sight. I, I come from drama, I come from theater. I went to the, the um, National Academy of Dramatic Arts. So, and then I, I studied, uh, te I did teacher training for uh, becoming a drama teacher. And I've been a drama teacher for a long time. But uh, when I met storytelling, uh, I knew that was where I wanted to go for the rest of my life. So, and the best way to become a storyteller is to listen to storytelling. My, my friend and uh, colleague, Roy Galor, from the School of Storytelling in Emerson College, he, when his students ask him, what is the best way of becoming a storyteller? He always answers, listening. Uh, uh, interesting. So, Tanishka from Stewart School and Anvesha, again, from... Uh, model public school as well as uh, uh, the someone else talking about asking about the COVID situation uh, Ranjan, about the COVID situation in Italy and how did you spend the lockdown period yeah so as you know we are the one who started it at least here in Europe I mean we, we had very 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 high numbers uh, at the beginning in March April May and a lot of people unfortunately died but uh, then the, everybody's been very cautious. And so now the numbers are rising, but we still can go out, we can travel, we can eat at restaurants. The schools are in this moment open, but uh, some are already closing because the uh, school year started a week ago here. And so because of uh, uh, contacts. Some classes are already closed, some schools are already closed, but we are. But what happened to me is quite funny because I was, um, I was, I was in England and I was supposed to come back on the 16th of March, uh, but I got stuck in England and so I stayed there until the 8th of July. So it was quite funny because I, my husband and I, we didn't have clothes. So it was summer and we either had big jumpers or were just with t-shirt you know, that you put underneath because we were, you can't go buy anything. You can't go out. We were locked down and we were a bit like this. We had, we had only one little suitcase. But it's enough. I mean, we had to wash the pants that I had in England. When I came back home, I had to throw them away. So worn they were. Uh, so, okay. Here is a question from Mexico. Kate Harris is asking, uh, saying that she loved your stories and uh, asking if you travel with your stories to festivals. Yes, very much. I travel a lot. As I was saying before, I've been to India in November, traveling a lot through India, but I've been to North America. I've been to Asia a lot of times, to Thailand, to uh, Singapore, and, uh, and, and a lot in Europe, a lot, really a lot. Yes, it's really a privilege. And, I, it, and it's something I really love. I love traveling and sharing stories. We look forward to having you here in Bhubaneshwar okay. uh, because you. Uh, some of you had asked, I think, uh, about uh, uh, her coming to Orissa, Sai Shubham particularly. She has not been, so we have to bring her uh, here. Uh, Prajukta, I think, had a problem in understanding uh, the story of St. Francis, so she asked, who is San Francisco? San Francisco. He he was a man. He was just a man of the Middle Ages, and uh, he became saint because he was a uh, he was holy. He was a very good person. 
and uh, and then he became the patron, which is uh, we have a, a, a person, a saint. Because that when you become saint, so there's a process. When you're a very very good person and you do something good to other people and you do miracles, then first you become beato, which is the middle stage, and then you become saint. And and the church recognizes you as saint. Uh, and then you become, and what the main thing that happens is that you're worshipped, but then that you have a day in the calendar. For example, St. Francis is the 4th of October, and so that is the day of St. Francis. And so everybody remembers St. Francis in that day. And then what happens is that each uh, town has a saint that we say, it's a tradition, of course, that protects that city. And so, for example, in Saint, in Florence, it is Saint John. Saint John is the protector of Florence. Saint Francis, because he's so important, is the protector of the whole of Italy, and that is what a patron saint is. So, I think the last question we'll take is from Diptanshu from DAV Pokriput. He's asking, what kind of similarities do you see between India and Italy? And let me add to that question. Do you think that both Indians and Italians are melodramatic? Yes, I think we are. We are melodramatic, but I think I pointed them out uh, during all the presentation. I think that the fact that we speak many languages in different places. Well, I think first of all, that we are warm people, that we are people with heart, that we are in general generous people, that we are welcoming people because, of course, I have sp spoken of only of the Italians that are born in Italy, maybe, but we are a, a, a country, I, as you, a country of immigration, a country of very different uh, people living together. So there's not, uh, so of course, the main people. Most people are Catholic, but we have many different religions. We have Muslims, we have Hindus, we have Buddhists, we have from, uh, and I think that overall we are, I think like India, a welcoming country. And uh, the passion for food, food is really important in India and in Italy. And as I said, the differences of languages, I think there are many things in common and uh, yeah, that things get done in some way. It's not very easy to understand how. For some people and people coming from different countries, they'd say it looks a bit confusing, but at the end... That's so true of India. Driving is a bit similar, I think. That, that's so true of India, that yeah. things get done. And, you so, know? Yeah. And, and I think I completely agree with you. People who love food, are normally good people yeah. you know uh, so <laughs> that's there so uh, there are many more questions that people have asked that many of you have asked but I'm sorry you've already way past one hour and we have to end but before I end uh, the teaser question for the session next time now of course the next Saturday is going to be 3rd October which comes right after 2nd October, of course, which is Gandhi's birthday. Now, the country that we'll travel to uh, next Saturday, uh, Gandhi had something to do, had a significant role in the making of that country. And the other clue is the youngest Nobel Prize winner. You know, you've heard of the Nobel Prize, which is the biggest prize given for any excellence in anything, uh, be it science or peace. Now, the youngest person and who got it when she was still legally a child, that is less than 18 years. Uh, so this youngest person to win the Nobel Prize is from this particular country. So guess which country we'll travel to next Saturday and send in your answers to contact uh, at gmail.com, our email ID that you have here. So till then, as, you, as I said, the session will be scheduled by Thursday with the question form and see you then. Tata, bye-bye. Giovanna, you want to say something? 
Yeah, I want to say ciao. I want to teach this way of saying bye bye, which is ciao. And uh, I think you you know it, but I really like to say thank you. Thank you for hosting me. Thank you for having me with you. And thank you. It's been an honor. And uh, I wish you all the best and best luck. And ciao. Thank you. And how do you say thank you? Grazie. 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 Ciao. 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 Grazie. Ciao. Bye. Thank you.